hi guys back to harry potter so harry finally ran into ron and hermione in diagon alley and they talked about what they did over the summer and went off to get some ice cream and that's where we are i am on page 58 so they paid for their ice cream and crossed the street to the magical menagerie there wasn't much room inside every inch of wall was hidden by cages it was smelly and very noisy because the occupants of these cages were all squeaking, squawking, jabbering, or hissing. The witch behind the counter was already advising a wizard on the care of double-ended newts, so Harry, Ron, and Hermione waited, examining the cages. A pair of enormous purple toads sat gulping wetly and feasting on dead blowflies. A gigantic tortoise with a jewel-encrusted shell was glittering near the window. Poisonous orange snails were oozing slowly up the side of their glass tank, and a fat white rabbit kept changing into a silk top hat and back again with a loud popping noise. Then there were cats of every color, a noisy cage of ravens, a basket of funny custard-colored furballs that were humming loudly, and on the counter a vast cage of sleek black rats that were playing some sort of skipping game using their long bald tails. The double-ended newt wizard left, and Ron approached the counter. It's my rat, he told the witch. He's been a bit off color ever since I brought him back from Egypt. Bang him on the counter, said the witch, pulling a pair of heavy black spectacles out of the pocket. Ron lifted Scabbards out of his inside pocket and placed him next to the cage of his fellow rats, who stopped their skipping tricks and scuffled to the wire for a better look. Like nearly everything Ron owned, Scabbers was the rat Scabbers the rat was second hand. He had once belonged to Ron's brother, Percy, and a bit battered. Next to the glossy rats in the cage, he looked especially woebegone. Hmm, said the witch, picking up Scabbers. How old is this rat? I don't know, said Ron. Quite old. He used to belong to my brother. What powers does he have? said the witch, examining Scabbers closely. Uh, the truth was that Scabbers had never shown the faintest trace of interesting powers. The witch's eyes moved from Scabbers's tattered left ear to his front paw, which had a toe missing, and tutted loudly. He's been through the mill, this one, she said. He was like that when Percy gave him to me, said Ron defensively. An ordinary common or garden rat like this can't be expected to live longer than three years or so, said the witch. Now, if you were looking for something a bit more hard-wearing, you might like one of these. She indicated the black rats, who promptly started skipping again. Ron muttered, show offs well if you don't want a replacement you can try this rat tonic said the witch reaching under the counter and bringing out a small red bottle okay said ron how much ouch ron buckled as something huge and orange came soaring from the top of the highest cage landed on his head and then propelled itself spitting madly at scabbers no crookshanks no cried the witch but Scabber shot from between her hands like a bar of soap, landed splay-legged on the floor, and then scampered for the door. Scabbers! Ron shouted, racing out of the shop after him. Harry followed. It took them nearly ten minutes to catch Scabbers, who had taken refuge under a waste paper bin outside quality Quidditch supplies. Ron stuffed the trembling rat back into his pocket and straightened up, massaging his head. What was that? It was either a very big cat or quite a small tiger, said Harry. Where's Hermione? Probably getting her owl. They made their way back up the crowded street to the magical menagerie. As they reached it, Hermione came out, but she wasn't carrying an owl. Her arms were clamped tightly around the enormous ginger cat. You bought that monster? said Ron, his mouth hanging open. He's gorgeous, isn't he? said Hermione, glowing. That was a matter of opinion, thought Harry. The cat's ginger fur was thick and fluffy, but it was definitely a bit bow-legged, and its face looked grumpy and oddly squashed, as though it had run headlong into a brick wall. Now that Scabbers was out of sight, however, the cat was purring contentedly in Hermione's arms. Hermione, that thing nearly scalped me, said Ron. He didn't mean to, did you, crookshakes, said Hermione. And what about Scabbers? said Ron, pointing at the lump in his chest pocket. He needs rest and relaxation. How's he going to get it with that thing around? That reminds me you forgot your rat tonic, said Hermione, slapping the small red bottle into Ron's hand. And stop worrying. Crookshanks will be sleeping in my dormitory and Scabbers in yours. What's the problem? 
Poor Crookshanks, that witch said he'd been in there for ages. No one wanted him. I wonder why, said Ron sarcastically as they set off toward the leaky cauldron. They found Mr. Weasley sitting in the bar reading the Daily Prophet. Harry, he said, smiling as he looked up. How are you? Fine, thanks, said Harry, as he, Ron, and Hermione joined Mr. Weasley with all their shopping. Mr. Weasley put down his paper, and Harry saw the now familiar picture of Sirius Black staring up at him. They still haven't caught him then? he asked. No, said Mr. Weasley, looking extremely grave. They've pulled us all off our regular jobs at the ministry to try and find him, but no luck so far. Would we get a reward if we caught him? asked Ron. It'd be good to get some more money. Don't be ridiculous, Ron, said Mr. Weasley, who on closer inspection looked very strained. Black's not going to be caught by a 13-year-old wizard. It's the Azkaban guards who will get him back. You mark my words. At that moment, Mrs. Weasley entered the bar, laden with shopping bags and followed by the twins, Fred and George, who were about to start their fifth year at Hogwarts. The newly elected head boy, Percy, and the Weasley's youngest child and only girl, Ginny. Ginny, who had always been very taken with Harry, seemed even more heartily embarrassed than usual when she saw him, perhaps because he had saved her life during their previous year at Hogwarts. She went very red and muttered hello without looking at him. Percy, however, held out his hand solemnly as though he and Harry had never met and said, Harry, how nice to see you. Hello, Percy, said Harry, trying not to laugh. I hope you're well, said Percy, Percy pompously shaking hands. It was rather like being introduced to the mayor. Very well, thanks. Harry, said Fred, elbowing Percy out of the way and bowing deeply. Simply splendid to see you, old boy. Marvelous, said George, pushing Fred aside and seizing Harry's hand in turn. Absolutely spiffing. Percy scowled. That's enough now, said Mrs. Weasley. Mom, said Fred, as though he'd only just spotted her and seizing her hand too. How really corking to see you. I said that's enough said Mrs. Weasley, depositing her shopping in an empty armchair. Hello, Harry, dear. I suppose you've heard our exciting news. She pointed to the brand new silver badge on Percy's chest. Second head boy in the family, she said, swelling with pride. And last, Fred muttered under his breath. I don't doubt that, said Mrs. Weasley, frowning suddenly. I notice they haven't made you two prefects. What do we want to be prefects for, said George, looking revolted at the very idea. It'd take all the fun out of life. Ginny giggled. You want to set a better example for your sister, snapped Mrs. Weasley. Ginny's got other brothers to set her an example, mother, said Percy loftily. I'm going up to change for dinner. He disappeared and George heaved a sigh. We tried to shut him in a pyramid, he told Harry, but Mums found us and caught us. Dinner that night was a very enjoyable affair. Tom the innkeeper put three tables together in the parlor, and the seven Weasleys, Harry and Hermione, ate their way through five delicious courses. How are we getting to King's Cross tomorrow, Dad? asked Fred as they dug into a sumptuous chocolate pudding. The ministry's prov providing a couple of cars, said Mr. Weasley. Everyone looked up at him. Why? said Percy curiously. It's because of you, Purse, said George seriously, and there will be little flags on the hoods with HB on them. For humongous butthead, said Fred. Everyone except Percy and Mrs. Weasley snorted into their pudding. Why are the ministry providing cars, Father? Percy asked again in a dignified voice. Well, as we haven't got one any more, said Mr. Weasley, and as I work there, they're doing me a favor. His voice was casual, but Harry couldn't help noticing that Mr. Weasley's ears had gone red, just like Ron's did when he was under pressure. Good thing, too, said Mrs. Weasley briskly. Do you realize how much luggage you've all got between you? A nice sight you'd be on the Muggle Underground. You are all packed, aren't you? Ron hasn't put all his new things in his trunk yet, said Percy in a long-suffering voice. He's dumped them on my bed. You'd better go and pack properly, Ron, because we won't have time in the morning. Mrs. Weasley called down the table. Ron scowled at Percy. After dinner, everyone felt very full and sleepy. One by one, they made their way upstairs to their rooms to check their things for the next day. Ron and Percy were next door to Harry. He had just closed and locked his own trunk when he heard angry voices through the wall and went to see what was going on. The door of number 12 was ajar and Percy was shouting, It was here on the bedside table! I took it off for polishing! I haven't touched it, all right! Ron roared back. What's up? said Harry. My head boy badge is gone! said Percy, rounding on Harry. So Scabber's rat tonic, said Ron, throwing things out of his trunk to look. 
I think I might have left it in the bar. You're not going anywhere till you've found my badge, yelled Percy. I'll get Scabbers' stuff. I'm packed, Harry said to Ron, and he went downstairs. Harry was halfway along the passage to the bar, which was now very dark, when he heard another pair of angry voices coming from the parlor. A second later, he recognized them as Mr. and Mrs. Weasley's. He hesitated, not wanting them to know he'd heard them arguing, when the sound of his own name made him stop, then move closer to the parlor door. Makes no sense not to tell him, Mr. Weasley was saying heatedly. Harry's got a right to know. I've tried to tell Fudge, but he insists on treating Harry like a child. He's thirteen years old. Arthur, the truth would terrify him, said Mrs. Weasley shrilly. Do you really want to send Harry back to school with that hanging over him? For heaven's sake, he's happy not knowing. I don't want to make him miserable. I want to put him on his guard, retorted Mr. Weasley. You know what Harry and Ron are like, wandering off by themselves. They've ended up in the Forbidden Forest twice. But Harry mustn't do that this year. When I think what could have happened to him that night, he ran away from home. If the night bus hadn't picked him up, I'm prepared to bet he would have been dead before the ministry found him. But he's not dead, he's fine. So what's the point? Molly, they say Sirius Black's mad. And maybe he is, but he was clever enough to escape from Azkaban, and that's supposed to be impossible. It's been three weeks, and no one's seen hide nor hair of him. And I don't care what Fudge keeps telling the Daily Prophet newspaper. We are no nearer catching Black than we are inventing self-spelling wands. The only thing we know for sure is what Black's after. But Harry will be perfectly safe at Hogwarts. We thought Azkaban was perfectly safe. If Black can break out of Azkaban, he can break into Hogwarts. But no one's really sure that Black's after Harry. There was a thud on wood, and Harry was sure Mr. Weasley had banged his fist on the table. Molly, how many times do I have to tell you? They didn't report it in the press because Fudge wanted it kept quiet. But Fudge went out to Azkaban the night Black escaped. The guards told Fudge that Black's been talking in his sleep for a while now. Always the same words. He's at Hogwarts. He's at Hogwarts. Black is deranged, Molly, and he wants Harry dead. If you ask me, he thinks murdering Harry will bring you-know-who back to power. Black lost everything the night Harry stopped you-know-who, and he's had twelve years alone in Azkaban to brood on that. There was silence. Harry leaned still closer to the door, desperate to hear more. Well, Arthur, you must do what you think is right, but you're forgetting Albus Dumbledore. I don't think anything could hurt Harry at Hogwarts while Dumbledore's headmaster. I suppose he knows about all this? Of course he knows. We had to ask him if he minds the Azkaban guards stationing themselves around the entrances to the school grounds. He wasn't happy about it, but he agreed. Not happy? Why shouldn't he be happy if they're there to catch Black? Dumbledore isn't fond of the Azkaban guards, said Mr. Weasley heavily. Nor am I, if it comes to that. But when you're dealing with a wizard like Black, you sometimes have to join forces with those you'd rather avoid. If they save Harry, then I will never say another word against them said Mr. Weasley warily. It's late, Molly. We'd better go up. Harry heard chairs move. As quietly as he could, he hurried down the passage to the bar and out of sight. The parlor door opened, and a few seconds later, footsteps told him that Mr. and Mrs. Weasley were climbing the stairs. The bottle of rat tonic was lying under the table they had sat at earlier. Harry waited until he heard Mr. and Mrs. Weasley's bedroom door close, then headed back upstairs with the bottle. Fred and George were crouching in the shadows on the landing, heaving with laughter as they listened to Percy dismantling his and Ron's room in search of his badge. We've got it, Fred whispered to Harry. We've been improving it. The badge now read Big Head Boy. Harry forced a laugh, went to give Ron the rat tonic, then shut himself in his room and lay down on his bed. So Sirius Black was after him. This explained everything. Fudge had been lenient with him because he was so relieved to find him alive. He'd made Harry promise to stay in Diagon Alley where there were plenty of wizards to keep an eye on him, and he was sending two ministry cars to take them all to the station tomorrow so that the Weasleys could look after Harry until he was on the train. Harry lay listening to the muffled shouting next door and wondered why he didn't feel more scared. Sirius Black had murdered 13 people with one curse. Mr. and Mrs. Weasley obviously thought Harry would be panic-stricken if he knew the truth. But Harry happened to agree wholeheartedly with Mrs. Weasley that the safest place on earth was wherever Albus Dumbledore happened to be. Didn't people always say that Dumbledore was the only person Lord Voldemort had ever been afraid of? Surely Black, as Voldemort's right-hand man, would be just as frightened of him. And then there were these Azkaban guards everyone kept talking about. They seemed to scare most people senseless, and if they were stationed all around the school, Black's chances of getting inside seemed very remote. Gotta stop there, guys. More later. Big hugs.